Hello there, I'm Ted Taylor, and I have glioblastoma multiform known as GBM. I know how devastating it is to hear this news firsthand, and I relate to you. So I make videos about GBM and what I have learned to share with you and your loved ones. I do not have any official or formal medical training, dietary training, or any other medical professional designation. These videos do not provide medical advice and are intended for informational purposes only. It is not a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Join me on this journey and we'll walk this path together. I think we can start. I welcome Ted Taylor, uh, which is the special guest of today. Uh, it's a really a pleasure to have uh, Ted here today. Let me share a very short presentation before starting with uh, Ted. Uh, what I will do is to translate everything in Italian. Okay, here we are. So Ted, and for, for the English people connected, um, Ted, uh, this, this, today we, we, the conference is dedicated to, to Ted, uh, to Ted Taylor and uh, to his story. Uh, the story is, uh, I mean, I would say Ted is really fantastic, a fantastic guy. Uh, he has got uh, glioblastoma in 2018 and uh, has developed this glioblastoma guide, which is a website where he gives information to the people who is uh, uh, who has the glioblastoma. So um, the speaker is, is Ted, and uh, I will just tell something about uh, the glioblastoma.it ODB, which is our volunteer organization, then Ted will uh, will tell us his story uh, through a video. Then there will be a session of question and answer. And in this session, uh, Ted will give uh, will reply in real time to your request. And at the end, I will just cheer you and, and close the works. So. Uh, Glioblastoma.it is a, a volunteer organization, was funded uh, in 2018. Uh, Emanuele, my 20 years old, old son, died due to a glioblastoma. On the, on the left, you can see a set of pictures from magnetic resonance uh, of a patient, of different patients with, with the glioblastoma. You all know that you all know that glioblastoma and glioblastoma is a very complex tumor it's on the brain. So in the brain and in, and is multiform. So it's different kind of uh, cells, um, and so it's very difficult to to win. Anyhow, we are we are trying to do more or less what what Ted is doing uh, with uh, this uh, organization. We are uh, trying to give information to the patient. I would say that this organization is dedicated to the patient. And uh, this is a website, is maintaining a website and other services. Uh, this is the picture of the website. The website uh, has over 2,000, uh, uh, 200,000 uh, users. Two thirds are coming from Italy, but uh, one third is coming for, from all, 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 all over the world. So let, let's start with the. Um, the the video which tells your story uh, is a fantastic video congratulations for this is very good quality first i would like to thank robbie and www.glioblastomamultiform.it for inviting me today to the conference 
I look forward to sharing some information and I hope that it can help you, your medical team, and your family in making more informed decisions. Thank you. Hello, I am Ted Taylor and I am a glioblastoma multiform survivor. Today is September 28th, 2022, and I'm going to be discussing my miracle in the making. I am a single father with three children, and I was diagnosed with glioblastoma multiform on October 24th, 2018. I am still here and will have reached the milestone of four years on October 24th, 2022. This is my story. The diagnosis. Initially, I started getting very terrible headaches. Some of you that have had this before, you'll know what I'm talking about. These are glioblastoma headaches and they are unbelievably painful. I went through this for a period of about a month and a half. During that time, I had gone to the emergency at the hospital twice each time they sent me home. I also went to my doctor and he too was not able to do much and he said uh, just to go home and it should clear up. After the month and a half was up, we went back to the emergency and this time demanded a scan. They were able to give me a CT scan and we were shocked to find out that I had a very large tumor. You can see here the very angry large tumor that is on the slide. And that tumor was about the size of a large egg and that's what was causing so much pressure in my head. Yeah. The actual doctor that was seeing me in the emergency, he knew of a surgeon and an expert who was in GBM. And so what he did was, is he called him and scheduled me for an appointment the next day. I went to see the doctor the next day. And when I saw the surgeon, he saw the images and he said, okay, we need to schedule this as soon as possible. And we scheduled the surgery for October 31st of 2018, only six days later. And this is where my research began. After coming home from my surgery, I was in recovery and preparing for what was to come with the radiation and chemotherapy. At this point, I was starting to do quite a bit of research. On one afternoon, it was quite unusual, but I sat down and turned on the TV and it had been set to the channel where the news was on and it so happened that the afternoon news was playing. At that moment, the next story that came up showed that the FDA had just approved a brand new drug and it was for treating cancer. I was quite interested, obviously, and at that moment, it started scrolling through a list of different cancers, and one of them was glioblastoma. I was shocked because there just hasn't been a drug like that before. So I put the show on record, and I watched it a couple of times, and then I dug into it a little bit, and I was able to find out that, unfortunately, there was only a 1% chance that I would actually have what is called the NTRK 1, 2, or 3 marker but I had to have my tumor genetically tested. So what I did at that point was, I brought the drug, which is called Larotrectinib or Betracvi, I brought that to one of my oncologists, and he said, I will look into it right away. We found out soon that it was not available in Canada, but step one was that I needed genetic testing. He was able to organize and get some initial local genetic testing done. However, this would not be very thorough. And I talked to another of my oncologists and he recommended that I try foundation medicine and the foundation one test. They're based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The initial results that came back from the local testing was a bit confusing because both the foreground and background tested positive and we didn't know what that meant. My oncologists and pharmacists, 
they made an application to Health Canada. At this point, we were working with Health Canada, and they gave approval under the Special Access Program, and I was the first patient in Canada on larotrectinib. In order for Bayer to supply the drug, they needed the report from Foundation One. But as we had already had that underway, we were able to receive it the next day after they made the request. It was unbelievable and one of the first steps in my miracle in the making. But I was in the 1% category and I was NTRK1 positive. This was thrilling news. At that point, the drug process started and we were able to get things moving. So Bayer got it arranged and it went from the United Kingdom to Germany and then to Vancouver where I'm based. I awaited the shipment at the pharmacy with my dad and we were able to take it home and then I was able to begin the treatment the next day which was on Good Friday of 2019. Something that is very rare with glioblastoma is hope. There often isn't very much. In this case, with this drug, larotrectinib, there was a whole new level. In their testing and in the trials, the efficacy has been 75% of patients respond to the drug, and an overwhelming 22% respond completely. Nothing like this had ever been seen before. In the past, temozolomide had been the largest breakthrough in 15 years, and it provides weeks of benefit for most patients. The standard of care is 14.6 months for my median survival time. That's with all the achievements in human history up to this point. There is no cure and a high rate of recurrence. Only 25% of patients survive more than one year. And the U.S. National Center for Biotechnology Information, the NCBI, lists long-term survival beyond three years limited to less than 2% of patients. In other words, 98% chance that you will not make it. This news of the larotrectinib, with its efficacy, was certainly good news and provided a lot of hope to my family and myself. Side effects and adjustments. I took Vitraxi two times per day with breakfast and dinner daily. The side effects are that it increased my liver enzymes substantially, my AST and ALT. These are the liver enzymes, and in my research I had seen that in the trials, some patients had to stop taking the drug because their liver enzymes had gone too high. So I'm a big proponent of being your own best advocate. So in this case, I did that, and I advocated for myself. And what I did was, I did further research to see how could I clear this up? How could I make it so that my ALT and AST numbers would come down? And what I had seen was that if I increased my water intake and also uh, some sunshine, which would increase my bilirubins, that this could offset some of that. As a result, I adjusted my water intake. First, I was doing three liters of water a day and this did not have an effect. I switched to four liters of water a day, and after another week of testing my blood, we had seen a substantial drop. We thought, okay, well, I'll try even more. So I went up to five liters of water a day, but unfortunately this had a negative effect and they started going back up again, and I think I was overtasking my liver at that point. So we switched back to four liters of water a day, and the results were excellent. In this slide, it is showing my ALT numbers on my blood work. And you can see that there is actually where the curve goes parabolic. And that's where we were very worried that I was going to be taken off the drug. But again, self-advocacy and adjusted the water intake, and you can actually see where it drops down and then stabilizes as a normal number. The next slide is my AST numbers.
And you can see the same thing occurred with the AST. Again, they went parabolic when I started taking larotrectinib, and then when I made the water and sunlight adjustments, it was able to drop and go back to a median area and stay within the safe zone for the whole period of time that I took the drug. So remember always, be your own best advocate. Adjustments. If we compare larotrectinib against the standard of care, we can see that in my case, my temozolomide reaction to my immune system with my red, white, and platelets all were very badly affected. In fact, I needed six platelet transfusions over the next five weeks when I finished my initial dose of temozolomide. They actually had to pull me off of the temozolomide before we completed the first course. With radiation, I had received 60 grays of radiation. And I was told 100% that I would lose the hearing in my right ear. The day before we were to begin my radiation treatment, my radiation oncologist called and said that due to my personal situation and the size of the tumor, that he felt that it was a better idea if we increased the radius of the radiation zone by an additional two and a half centimeters all the way around the tumor. That would result, unfortunately, in me losing my hearing in my right ear. Now, I can explain that when I was halfway through the radiation treatment, I did lose the hearing in my right ear. That night, I prayed, and when I woke up in the morning, my hearing was restored, and it's been back ever since. So, I'm not the same person that I was, but I'm blessed to be alive. I still have my calm and friendly personality, which they told me would not be usual under the circumstances with the size of the tumor, the amount of radiation that I had to receive. But I'm able to parent my children and continue on. Also, with the chemotherapy, I did have a lot of the symptoms. I did have some hair loss. I had definitely nausea and vomiting, and my blood work was greatly affected. This next slide shows the liquid versus the capsule version on larotrectinib. On April 19th, 2019, I started on the capsule version of the TRACV. And on September 7th, 2019, I started the liquid version. The reason this took place is that I was taking the capsule under the special access program, but Health Canada actually approved the drug for Canada on July 31st, 2019 but their approval was only for the liquid version. This made sense because they approved it for all Canadians, and in that case there would be some pediatric patients, and they cannot take the full dose of the capsule, so you can adjust the dose using the liquid. However, it was not very good for adults because the liquid has to be kept within a very tight temperature range, which meant that I was anchored to my home because I could not go out and risk spoiling the medication. So any trips with my children or just going on an outing, these all became very major issues. So I worked with Health Canada and spoke with them and spoke with, as an advocacy person for the drug, uh, but also with Health Canada, I spoke to them and advocated for all other people that were on it that the capsule version is much better for adults and it was approved through Health Canada, and I was back on the capsules in December of 2020. Scans and results. When I had the tumor originally, it was so large that it had actually shifted the midline in my brain. You will be able to see that in just a moment. Now the tumor had been shrinking. And the personal impact on me with taking larotrectinib was, is that this is saving my life. You can see on the next slide here, the very large tumor that we had initially. And on the upper left slide, you can see how the midline had shifted on my brain. On the right, you can see after being on larotrectinib and after the surgery and the temozolomide as well. The area highlighted in red 
is showing now where the tumor used to be. And you can see how things have much improved and that the area is starting to stabilize and that the midline shift is gone. Out of all the people watching this, one in every hundred people will likely test positive for this drug. And in some cases with pediatric brain cancer, the percentages are much higher. And with other types of cancer, because the track fee works with all solid forms of cancer, as long as you have the NTRK1, 2, or 3 marker. So get out there and get genetically tested. In cases of breast cancer, there are some where it's almost 100% of cases. So it's very important to get tested, no matter which form of cancer that you have. And with glioblastoma, yes, there's a lower chance, but with pediatric, there's a higher chance. So it's worth getting tested, and who knows? It may not be vitrectomy that you test positive for, but it could be some other drug that's coming up. So I urge everybody to get tested. The future of medicine is to get tested genetically. No matter how up-to-date our oncologists are and our doctors, they simply cannot know every new drug or treatment out there. Research and become your own best advocate and work with a receptive oncologist. Personal impact. What is the personal impact of the track fee on my life? I can tell you that it has saved me, but also I can tell you that it made me feel even more so that I needed to give back, that I needed to tell people about this and about other possibilities. It's not as though this is going to cure everybody or that there's some kind of magic. It's simply information that we can use with our family and medical team to have all the options available to us so that we can make the best decisions possible. Be your own best advocate. And I wanted to help others, so I'll get into that a little bit later because I've done some things to try and help others. In addition to doing larotrectinib and vitrectomy, I have done other adjunct therapies, including the Keto for Cancer diet. I have also taken Boswellia, and I took that all throughout my radiation therapy. They told me that everybody that gets radiation therapy in this amount, they will end up going on dexamethasone to reduce the swelling and so that they can handle the rest of the treatment. In my case, I had been taking Boswellia throughout, and I never had to go on dexamethasone. So this is just more information for you. I get regular exercise. I stay at peace. I have some relaxed time each day. I go on walks with family and friends. I have some quiet time. And I have looked into and researched other areas, including osimertinib or Tegriso with the EGFR variant 3 marker, which I'll get into more. I've looked into checkpoint inhibitors, including PARP, P-A-R-P. And that is a possibility where they're doing studies right now that when temozolomide stops working, if you take the PARP inhibitor, then that can reactivate it in some people. So I can constantly looking at ways to actually move the time clock in my favor, as I'm hoping that there will eventually be some kind of treatment that may ultimately cure the glioblastoma or provide me with more time. There's also another area that I'm excited about is CART-T, multiple antigens and checkpoint inhibitors. So that's chimeric antigen receptor and using multiple antigens and checkpoint inhibitors. Another area I've been looking into is DC Vaxo. I will discuss this later. My brother Jamie told me about this in May of 2022 and I contacted Dr. Riva at McGill University in Montreal, Canada, but the intake had been closed since 2015. I looked into it further on Robbie's site at glioblastomamultiform.it, which has great information there as well. And I'll keep pursuing these different options. Glioblastoma guide. I wanted to give back and also to inform people about different options that are available. The standard of care provides what we already know. 
a median survival of about 14.6 months. But maybe there are things that we can do to extend that a little. I looked into things, and some of the things that I've done, those are on my YouTube channel and website. And you can find it at glioblastomaguide.com or on YouTube under Glioblastoma Guide. I would urge everybody to go to the YouTube channel and to subscribe to the channel, watch the videos, like the videos, and that will help others find them that are desperately trying to find some kind of information that they can review and go over with their medical team. Robbie and I talked and we wanted to try and do something together as a collaboration. So our websites and the YouTube channel, they are going to work together to try and help as many people as possible. So with www.glioblastomamultiform.it and Glioblastoma Guide, we're collaborating to provide information to make your best decisions about your care with your medical team, family, and friends. I hope that this together will provide a synergetic effect that is better than either of our sites and YouTube channel alone. In 2021, we went through a very difficult period. Sometimes things aren't going to go the way that you want them to go in life, as we all know when we've been diagnosed with glioblastoma. We found that I was in the 1% and was able to take larotrectinib vitracti, and we had a durable response for two and a half years. Then suddenly, September 1st of 2021, I had a recurrence, and we thought that this might be the end. In only three months, it had grown from zero in the MRI to a large tumor. At that point, it was so large and growing so quickly that we scheduled surgery for September 15th, 2021. My next MRI was November 15th, 2021, and there was yet another recurrence. In fact, in only two months, it was even larger than the last tumor in September. We had surgery on December 8th of 2021. Having two surgeries like that together was quite tiring and it was a lot to go through. We had the next MRI on December 28th, 2021. Yet again, we were shocked. There was a tumor again and it was even larger than the last one. At this point, we figured that this was going to be the end and that we had done all we could. But we talked with the neurosurgeon and we arranged for surgery to take place on January the 12th of 2022. The measured tumor that we had seen in the MRI and that they had reported on when they did the surgery was not there. What was clearly a large tumor had disappeared and we had experienced another miracle in my journey. However, this was three brain surgeries in only four months. And this was very difficult time period, but be your own best advocate. Keep working, keep moving the clock forward, buying more time. Who knows what is around the corner? As a single dad with three kids, I needed to buy more time and find out what we could do. Research, what's next? One of the most promising potential treatments I have been following is CART-T with multiple antigens and checkpoint inhibitors. I believe this may provide some possibilities when used in combination with the standard of care as GBM is heterogeneous and the microenvironment is both hostile and ever-changing. A multi-prong approach seems to offer the best possibilities. Robbie and I both are in agreement on this, that a cocktail approach to tackling GBM has the best chance against this ever-changing disease. As I have said, I am currently researching DC Vaxel, and I feel it may be the most exciting possibility for GBM that I have ever seen. This is the largest increase in overall survival in both new and recurrent GBM cases. And we are not talking about weeks of additional time as has happened with the optum and temozolomide in the past. Instead, 
Some of the initial results are reported as multiples of the current median survival times. I must say all of this with caution, as we need to await the study to be both peer-reviewed and approved by the FDA and other medical bodies around the globe. Continuing on discussion about DC Vaxel, how does the process work? It uses dendritic cells. Those dendritic cells are the quarterbacks of your immune system, and they harness them. If I explain the process, the best way to do it in a nutshell is you go through a process called leukapheresis. It's a two to three hour process where they extract blood and put it into a centrifuge to extract the dendritic cells. Next, they must have a representative tumor sample from the most recent tumor that was flash frozen without any preservatives or saline, and it needs to be stored at minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit. They will need two to three grams of the tumor tissue. This tumor is broken down into its constituent parts using enzymes becoming autogalous tumor lysate. These parts are then exposed to the dendritic cells. The dendritic cells develop antibodies to the cancer. These dendritic cells have learned how to recognize your specific cancer. Next, they concentrate the dendritic cells and produce vials which are stored in liquid nitrogen. Finally, this new vaccine is given to the patient in specific doses over a prescribed timeline. The vaccine of learned dendritic cells are injected into your arm muscle where they make their way to the lymphatic system. Once there, they interact with T cells who then multiply and rally the entire immune system to target the cancer. Now that the immune system can see the cancer, it goes about killing it. Success has been strong and there have been almost zero side effects, which is extremely rare, as we know, with a lot of cancer care. If there is a recurrence down the road, they can repeat the process to target the new version of the glioblastoma. I am currently working to bring DC Vaxel into Canada and to try to have it approved by Health Canada. Additionally, I am working to have it approved by the Cancer Agency and added to the standard of care for all GBM patients. It should be noted that the researchers believe this same treatment may be successful with all solid forms of cancer. This is truly amazing. You will notice the picture on the side. It says PFTM. That stands for our slogan that we've been using since I was diagnosed, and it's Pray for Ted's Miracle. And I appreciate any of your prayers. There are lots of tough decisions, many of them I've had to make on a very quick time period, such as expanding the radius of radiation where I would lose my hearing. Very difficult decision. In the end, I ended up keeping my hearing. But one never knows. We have to be able to weigh these decisions out. And knowing that there's possibilities for those ahead of time, it can help us so that we're more calm and can make the decisions in a better way. As I've said, be your own best advocate. I cannot stress how important it is to me to learn all you can from credible sources and then to make decisions with your family and medical team and then take action. The standard of care provides predictable results, which none of us are looking for. As you can see on this slide, it has the photo of the group of hikers making it to the summit of a peak. This is something that I feel we're all in together with glioblastoma. Please know that I am praying for each of you and your families. Our largest enemy is time with GBM and doing all we can with possibilities with efficacy to buy more time includes prayer for me each day. In this slide you can see I was fortunate enough when the Olympics came to Vancouver in 2010 that I was an Olympic torchbearer. At this time, I would like to thank Robbie, my oncologist, pharmacist, surgeon, the support of my family, friends, and all those who helped make Vitracvi, Osimertinib, and DC Vaxel possible, which is all part of my miracle in the making. I hope you have enjoyed this presentation. I have enjoyed speaking with you today. Thank you very much, Robbie, for arranging all this and for all you have done to help others. 
This is my glioblastoma guide business card so that you can see easily how to contact me or go to my website or my YouTube channel. I have also done it up with QR codes so it's easy for you to get to them. If you do go to my YouTube channel, I do have a playlist with all of the episodes all in a row so that it's easy for you to go there and do that. Please sign up, become a subscriber, watch the videos and like them. And if you'd like, leave a nice comment or two and that would be very helpful and it helps encourage the process. Thank you so much for this time and I'll be seeing you soon. Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> At the moment, there are no, no uh, specific questions. Of course, uh, I, I have one. So uh, now, uh, do you have decided the next step for you? Yes, at this point, uh, we are actually working on the next step we had. Uh, I didn't talk about it during the presentation too much, but I had tried a, a directed therapy uh, due to genetic testing, I had tested positive for the EGFR variant 3 in all of my tumors. And in the last two, it was highly overexpressed. Mm -hmm. As a result, we researched and found Dr. Lesser in North Carolina, and he was conducting a small directed therapy trial using ozomertinib, uh, which goes after EGFR variant 3, and it's normally used for non-small cell lung cancer, but in this case, it was actually uh, shown to cross the blood-brain barrier when the non-small lung cancer had actually metastasized in the brain, and it was able to treat it there. So mm -hmm. this trial was to see if we could target the glioblastoma in the brain. There's very small quantity of people doing the testing uh, and participating, but I was fortunate enough to be one of them. Uh, unfortunately, uh, just up until uh, yesterday, uh, we had tried everything we could for my body to deal with the drug, but my platelets had crashed uh, once again, even on the lowest dose we could try with the drug. As a result, we uh, are now in between treatments but we do have a meeting coming up uh, in the next uh, two weeks where we will be able to hopefully meet with another specialist. And uh, at that time, hopefully that will open up another path. But we are always looking at what's next because we know GBM won't wait. Mm -hmm. So we have to be ready for what's next. Because if we just follow the standard of care with temozolomide, we know eventually it will stop working. And then the only thing after that uh, is basically uh, just to um, uh, take the bevacizumab or Avastin. And that's uh, not what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. Ted, there is a, a question. Yes. Uh, uh, so uh, your uh, recurrences were always in the same place, in the same zone in brain? That is correct. Yes, each time in the right front temporal lobe. Okay, see, another question is uh, regarding the NMR. No? You do uh, NMR uh, uh, every three months or more frequently? More frequently now. We, we were, before these occurrences, uh, we were doing uh, the MRI scans every four months. However, when we had the recurrence, we've switched and continued with every two months. Okay. Uh, uh, did, did you ever try the cannabis? There is one, one question. You know that uh, from some papers, it seems that also ca cannabinoids are uh, having an effect on glioblastoma. So the question is, uh, have you ever tried this? Uh, can you repeat what it is called? Yes, yes, it's, it's cannabis, marijuana, cannabis. Oh, cannabis, oh, I see. I, <laughs> I have not. Yeah, I'm not uh, a big proponent of that, but 
I know it uh, helps some people. So that is um, definitely uh, uh, a personal choice on that one. But I know that uh, it is available in Canada, but I haven't had any pain. And also um, there's been limited uh, studies uh, that I have seen that show the benefit for doing it. So I tend to focus more on things for me that I can understand the science on and work towards um, finding out through clinical trials and that kind of situation if it's something to me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question uh, is, have you ever done infusions of uh, uh, vitamin C? Yeah, I have not done um, uh, that of uh, vitamin C or uh, any of the other uh, uh, infusions like that. However, each day I do take um, large doses of vitamin C as part of the, uh, I have a whole regimen of different supplements uh, that I take. Uh, some of the B uh, complex, I take vitamin C, vitamin D, uh, vitamin K, and other ones that support my platelets, because that's been a real Achilles heel for me uh, mm -hmm. with any of the treatments. So mm -hmm. I take, for instance, papaya leaf tea and papaya leaf extract. Uh, and I also take the boswellia each day. Even though I'm not on radiation, I still take boswellia because it keeps inflammation down. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, there is another question. Uh, yes. It's connected to hyperthermy. It seems uh, that you did the hyperthermy uh, in uh, in your uh, in your path, and uh, the question is uh, for how long, and are you doing this also today or not? Okay, great question. Um, I am no longer doing hyperthermia. Um, I was doing it at uh, the process where I was having radiation and chemotherapy, as that was. Uh, in the studies, that was the highlighted time to do it. So concurrently, while going through radiation and chemotherapy, I did hyperthermia. And that uh, was a very e easy process uh, for me to do. Um, and it is not covered uh, in Canada under our medical system, but we paid uh, for that process to be done. And I am grateful for it because it does show uh, that those patients that do it uh, are definitely um, having a longer, uh, prolonged life. Mm -hmm. Can you recall the number of months that you did this? Uh, it was for a month and a half. Okay, okay, okay. So, Ted, I just uh, said that, uh, that uh, what will happen. So, I'm, I really thank you. For, for all you are done and for your participation uh, today. Now uh, we will prepare a page on the website with the summary of what happened today and the connection to the, the video stream the, of the recording. Okay, the stream of the recording. So uh, thanks again and have a nice evening. And in your, in your case, have a nice day. <laughs> Grazi, thank you so much for arranging all this, Robbie. I really do appreciate it. And I hope that uh, we have done some good together. I'm sure. I'm sure. Ci, mi ringrazia, insomma, e spera che abbiamo fatto qualcosa di utile insieme. Ecco. Grazie a tutti e buona serata. Grazie. Grazie. Thank you very much. Okay. See you.